Well, to implement a filter, we can convolve the impulse response with the input of the system. And this raises naturally the question of whether we can actually do this in the frequency domain, implement a filter, by multiplying the discrete Fourier transform coefficients. So here we've illustrated the convolution multiplication property for the discrete time Fourier transform. And that says if I have an input x of n through some filter or system in general, h of n, I get an output y of n. And the output y of n is the convolution of the impulse response of the filter with the input. And if I take the discrete time Fourier transform, I see that I end up with this filtering action being given by the product of the discrete time Fourier transform of the impulse response and the discrete time Fourier transform of the input. Now since the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT, samples the discrete time Fourier transform, the question is whether we can represent this operation numerically using the DFT or whether it's only of conceptual value. In other words, can we do filtering with the DFT by simply multiplying the DFT coefficients of the filter with the DFT coefficients of the input. And we might get a block diagram that looks like this. We have an input x of n, take a DFT, that gives us DFT coefficients xk. We multiply those by the corresponding DFT coefficients for the impulse response hk, and those yk's then get an inverse DFT to obtain y of n. There's a couple of issues to keep in mind with doing filtering in this manner. First of all, in order to use the DFT, you need to have a block of data. In other words, we're not going to take one sample of x of n at a time. We're going to take a block of, say, capital N samples of x of n to do this. So I have to accumulate those samples, and then I get a whole block of output samples. Now, the other factor that comes in here is the convolution multiplication property for the DFT which is slightly different than the convolution multiplication property for the discrete time Fourier transform, as we will see shortly. So the fact that we have to process a block of data at a time, in other words, computing one discrete Fourier transform coefficient requires all these samples, that means we have to accumulate this data, and that would introduce a time lag in a real-time application. That's really not much of a concern in a case where data is stored, because we can access all these samples at once. But if n is large and we are having to wait to collect all that data before we can process it, sometimes that can be a factor in whether this is a wise thing to do or not. Now the other question that comes up is what happens when you multiply DFT coefficients? What does that do in the time domain? So we're going to have a signal x of n, and we're going to take an endpoint DFT to get coefficients xk. Similarly, we're going to have the impulse response h of n. We'll take an endpoint DFT to get coefficients hk. And if I form yk as the product of these DFT coefficients, the question is, what does the time signal look like? And it turns out that with a bit of algebra and definitions of the DFT, you can write that the inverse DFT of the product of these coefficients is given by the convolution of h of n with a sum from L equals minus infinity to infinity, X of N minus LN. So this is a shifted version of X of N, and we're gonna shift each term is shifted by L times N, and then we're gonna add those all up. And basically, this is a consequence of the fact that we are sampling in frequency. We said earlier that the discrete Fourier transform samples the discrete time Fourier transform. We saw when we looked at sampling in the time domain that sampling in the time domain introduced replication in the frequency domain. We had the spectrum or the Fourier transform of the original signal and it was replicated at multiples of the sampling frequency. Well, the same sort of thing happens here. When we sample in frequency, we get replicates of the signal in the time domain and those replicates are shifted by capital N. So you can see right away that this is not ordinary convolution. In fact, the name that is given to this operation is circular convolution because it's as if we did a periodic extension of x of n, in other words, wrapped x of n around a circle, and then did the convolution with h of n. So in order to recover the original linear convolution, h convolved with x, 
from this product of DFT coefficients, the circular convolution, what has to happen is we have all these sums in here and the h of n convolved with x of n term must not overlap with h of n convolved with x of n plus n or h of n convolved with x of n minus n, any of the other terms in here. Okay, we want the L equals zero term here not to overlap with any of the other terms. And if that's the case, then I can isolate the L equals zero term here and identify that as y of n. So this brings up questions about, well, how long is a convolution and when do things overlap and when do they not overlap? So the duration of the convolution is the key. So to look at this, we're going to assume that we have a signal x of n whose duration is m sub x. In other words, it has m sub x sample, non-zero samples. So it starts at zero and the last value will be m sub x minus one and it's zero outside of that interval. Similarly, we'll assume that h of n has m sub h non-zero samples in it so that it goes basically from zero through m sub h minus one. And the question is, how long is the convolution of these two finite duration signals? Well, to look at that, we can use some basic properties of the impulse response. And if I break x of n up into individual terms, I can see what the duration is going to become. Because the first term, let's pick this impulse at zero. So I'm going to look at the effect of this term alone. But when I convolve this impulse with the impulse response, I just get back the impulse response. And so this first component here leads to an output which has duration m sub h. Then if I look at the second component and I isolate that and I say, well, what's this going to produce when I put this input into the system? Well, this is just an impulse delayed by one sample. So I'm going to get as an output the impulse response delayed by one sample because the system is time invariant. And if I continue this process, let's go to the last term here. Then when I put an impulse here at time m sub x minus 1 in, what I'm going to get is a delayed version of the impulse response that starts at time m sub x minus 1, and then it finishes at m sub x plus m sub h minus 2. And because this system is linear, to find the output to this overall input, we can add up the outputs to the individual ones. And we really don't want to do that from a computational standpoint, but to give us an idea of how long the output lasts, it's very straightforward because the output started at time 0 and ends here at m sub x plus m sub h minus 2. So clearly this convolution x of n and h of n has a duration m sub x plus m sub h minus 1. So it's the length of x plus the length of h minus 1. That's how long the linear convolution of two finite duration sequences lasts. So I've restated that here, that h of n convolved with x of n is duration m sub h plus m sub x minus 1. Now we're concerned about whether this term overlaps with shifted versions of this term. And it turns out that if we look at the individual terms we had in that infinite sum, they're h of n convolved with x of n minus l times cap n. And all this expression represents is because the system is time invariant, if I delay the input by x of n by a certain amount, I'm just going to delay the output. So this convolution is identical to h of n convolved with x of n if I shift it then by l times n. So in order to avoid overlap, I've got shifts of n between successive terms of h of n convolved with x of little n minus capital N. There's shifts of n between those and I have a duration of m sub h plus m sub x minus 1 for each of those. So to prevent overlap, I require that the number of DFT coefficients, capital N, must exceed the duration of x plus the duration of h minus 1. And if this is satisfied, if I choose my DFT to have that many samples, then circular convolution becomes the same as linear convolution. If I choose n less than that, say I choose n to be equal to m sub x, 
then I no longer have this equality and I can't use the DFT to compute a linear convolution. Practice, the way this works is we're going to take h of n and x of n and we're going to add zeros to the end of those sequences until we get to a length n sequence. And at that point, we can take their DFTs, multiply them, take the inverse DFT. And we've been treating x of n as if it is a finite duration block, but it turns out you can adapt this idea of multiplying coefficients in the frequency domain to cases where x of n is a stream of data that's coming in. And this is referred to as fast convolution. Now it does have the time delay that I spoke about earlier because of the fact that we're processing the data in blocks of length n. But the way it works is that if we have an FIR system with impulse response h of n, then I can take x of n and break it up into segments. I'll use the FFT algorithm, which is in a very efficient way of calculating the DFT, in order to find the DFT coefficients of x of n and h of n. I multiply those, again use an FFT algorithm to do the inverse DFT, and then from the output of each segment, I'm going to put back together y of n. So that's kind of the how fast convolution works, but we're not going to look in this lecture at the details of how to accomplish this. The reason this is called fast convolution is because it actually can be more numerically efficient, require less computation time to do the multiplication in the frequency domain and reconstruct the output from those individual terms than to directly do the convolution. It depends on how long of a block, how big n is that you choose, how long h of n is, in other words m sub h, and a number of other parameters, but in certain cases this can be significantly faster than doing the convolution directly. So it is common to use the DFT for filtering and it's especially common and helpful when we look at multi-dimensional signals such as images because then typically we're dealing with finite dimensional signals to begin with some image that is supported in some interval here and we want to do a filter on this well it's not like we have a stream of time signals we've just got a finite duration image and in this case it's very efficient to use a two-dimensional FFT to compute the two-dimensional DFT coefficients and to implement a filter in two dimensions by multiplication. So that's a, a very common application of this idea of implementing filters in the frequency domain.